Okay, well, welcome again, everybody. Uh, and this is Living Longer, the Science of Longevity. And uh, this event is sponsored by the School of Medicine, Basic Sciences at Vanderbilt University. And it's part of our monthly lab to tables conversations where we bring together uh, expert researchers uh, to discuss biomedical issues of current and broad interest. And so um, I'm Chuck Sanders. I'm the Associate Dean for Basic Sciences here at Vanderbilt. And um, I'd like to introduce to you our uh, moderator for today, Dr. Laura Niedernhofer uh, from the Institute of Biology of Aging and Metabolism at the University of Minnesota, where she is also Professor of Biochemistry, Molecular Biology, and Biophysics. And I just wanna say proudly that she's an alumnus of our institution here and a member of our board of visitors. And we're really, really thrilled to have her uh, host this event. We have three other panelists uh, who Laura will introduce in a moment here. So um, longevity research uh, is an extremely active area of current biomedical research. There's been a lot of progress in recent years. And so the panel today, We'll discuss our current understanding of the biology of, of living long, and also discuss um, how uh, recent research developments and also how some of what we know now about uh, longevity can be applied in our everyday life. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. Welcome and thank you. Well, thank you so much, Chuck. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yes, I'm a proud alumnus of the MD-PhD program at, at Vanderbilt University, and that really set me up for a, what's been an incredibly fun career. And longevity research is really my passion, so this is going to be super fun this afternoon. So I'm a direct, I was recruited to University of Minnesota just three years ago to direct a new effort to study the biology of aging and metabolism, and we're hopeful to develop therapeutics that target those mechanisms. So I'm looking forward to hear more about them from all of my uh, colleagues here on the panel. So Chris, will you please introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, Laura. I'm Chris Berkowitz. I'm an assistant professor in cell and de developmental biology here at Vanderbilt, um, and a lifelong, I think, aging geek at this point. I, Started out in a, as an undergraduate working on telomere biology and then also did my PhD here at Vanderbilt working on protein aggregation and have moved on since to work on nutrient sensing pathways, diet, uh, and cell biology in the way that these, these processes interact with aging as well. Great. Rafael, please. Hi, uh, my name is Rafael Rojo Idrigo. I'm a, a, a new recruit to Vanderbilt. Uh, I've been at the, uh, um, at the molecular physiology and biophysics department for the past year. And I'm naturally from Brazil. I got my PhD in thyroid hormone metabolism. Then I shifted into advanced microscopy and then landed into the aging field uh, by uh, studying basically how old cells are in different organs. And here at Vanderbilt, uh, my lab is focusing in, in identifying how old cells can be in different organs and the biological processes that occur as they go through their uh, normal lifetime. And Laura, please. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> um, so I'm a professor of uh, medicine and geriatrics. Um, I actually am clinically active and see older patients. Um, and I also run a, a neuroscience research laboratory that's interested in how inflammatory mechanisms may um, either impact healthy aging of the brain and also transitions into diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. And we also study uh, mitochondria and uh, protein um, homeostasis as part of that uh, panel of things we look at. Well, thank you all. This is really exciting. We're gonna get very diverse perspectives on aging and, and that's always where good science happens. So I'd like to start by asking each of you, how do you define aging in, in your research platform? And uh, I think it's, it's a tricky thing to do because we know what it looks like, but to define it is really a challenge. So Raphael, you start at the cellular level, please. Okay, so um, I define aging as a time-dependent event that affects cells and tissues in different ways, but it's generally associated with a decline in cellular and tissue function. Great, and let's take Great. it up oh, Chris. to yeah. model organisms, Chris. 
Yeah, so we, we think about it at the, the animal level a lot, and there's kind of, a I guess, a technical definition for that, which I'll, I'll rely on, which is an increase in disease and disability and death that occurs over time, probabilistic increase in that risk. Um, and so that's how we think of, of the problem, is, is how to mitigate that risk, really. Great. And Laura, can I bring, can I bring a bit of a clinician's perspective yeah. really briefly, and that is that for me, um, aging starts when development ends, which would mean that we start aging when we're in our, our 20s, actually, but it's not all bad. And we, we can think of a few people that are in their 40s that are uh, doing quite well right now, um, football players and so forth. So, so aging um, certainly does increase uh, disease risk and so forth, but um, biologically, it may be starting earlier than we sort of typically think, so... Yeah. So, Laura, as a clinician, why is aging research so important as opposed to thinking about all these diseases that we fear, like right. Alzheimer's or cancer? Right. So, so a lot of the things we define as diseases, which, of course, cancer is, is one that is dreaded, but also we've made an incredible impact in treatments, are circumscribed events. But for most of them, other than things that happen in childhood, aging is probably the greatest risk factor, certainly for diseases of the brain. Um, you know, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, strokes and so forth are very different uh, injury processes or diseases, but aging, that fundamental process uh, contributes to all of them. And so we, we think about it, I think all of my colleagues too, as that's some place that we can make a, a big difference, a big intervention that would affect a lot of different disease processes. So. Um, that's why we're talking today, in fact. So. Yeah, it, it's an exciting prospect for sure. So Chris is one who uses a model organism in your research to sort of accelerate um, all of this. Do you think there's a universality to, to biology of aging? Like how do your worms relate to what we're trying to do in humans? Yeah, so I, I always hesitate a little bit to say universal because with so many species, there's always an exception. And, and I can touch on that in a second, but I, you know, there's an incredible range um, in, in lifespan across the animal kingdom, ranging from typically small things like insects that live for a few days um, to marine life, these whale and shark species and quahogs that live for 200 plus years. And I think this is what's really cool, this kind of comparative biology, look at what's going around us, going on around us about the aging process, which is that it's not a fixed rate at which it occurs. The biological aging process varies really very widely. Um, and this was a major clue for a long time that, that biological aging, not chronological aging, but biological aging is modifiable and, and there's different ways um, in which we can age. And um, so I think, you know, touching on some of those exceptions, there's, there's for a long time, there's this kind of metabolic rate theory of aging um, that vast metabolic rates kind of define whether you live for a short life or a long life once you run out of energy or accumulate enough damage. Um, but there's lots of things that don't seem to, to fit that correlation. And these end up being a really interesting area of aging biology, kind of looking at the animals that don't fit that mold. Things like birds and bats, which have high metabolic rates, but don't seem to live as short um, a lifespan as, as other animals that live those same ages. The naked mole rat, which is you know, evades cancer and other types of age-related diseases. And then there's things like the hydra, um, which is, I, I think, the most famous, maybe one of the only animals that we think doesn't show any signs of aging, but it kind of uses strategies that are hard to adopt in, in humans. So it you know, uses strategies like being made mostly of stem cells, um, which we, we obviously can't do. Um, but there's lots of links, I think, lots of interesting ways to, to impact our understanding. And we'll probably touch on this later, but at the fundamental level, you know, when we talk about molecules and cells, all of life is built somewhat similarly. And, and the same kinds of things that happen at, with age at those kinds of levels, they, they go wrong in the same ways across all, all species, really. So that's where the universality really comes from, I think. And then within a species, though, would you define aging as heterogeneous or rather homogeneous? It's a great question. So I mean, we, we work in C. elegans, um, a little roundworm that lives uh, on average for about three weeks. But even in a completely isogenic, completely genetically identical population where they're all clones of each other, and they all live in exactly the same little laboratory petri dish, they vary in lifespan from, from two weeks to four weeks. So, you know, by, by 50%. 
Yeah. Um, so there's there's absolutely variation even that we don't totally understand really, you know, even with these genetically identical populations in, in how we age. Um, and of course, there have been major discoveries along the way that, that I'm sure we'll touch on as we go forward, um, that single genes and different sets of genes can kind of control that process or the rate at which that process occurs in different ways. And this is what's really exciting, I think, about the aging field today. Yeah, and and if, if, if I may chip in, I mean, basically, I, I, I think that we also don't know if, like, you know, speaking to how homogeneous aging is, we just don't know how fast individual organs are aging. And, and, and that goes from the warm all the way over to, 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 to humans, right? I mean, I think that we, when we think about, when I think about aging, I think, of, I think about it as a very heterogeneous um, process. And I think it all the way, you know, down to individual tissues, to cells, and then even parts of the cell that might be going through aging or through time at different rates. And I think that we're just starting to understand that. And, and, and I think that that's, that's a very exciting part. I agree. And then when you realize that each of us is made up of over a trillion cells and you think that's all going to kind of change synchronous, synchronously, it's, it's just impossible. Yeah. So Raphael, describe your background for us and tell us what it's revealing about the hallmarks of aging. Right. So, okay. So, so my, my laboratory was basically founded in the prince in, in the basic discovery that um, there are, you know, neurons are generally accepted as large are cells that are born with us and then they will live as long as we do. So, and they have very little, if any, regeneration potential. So basically that's why uh, brain injuries or degenerative diseases of the brain are so bad because we can't grow new neurons and, and these cells are pretty much stuck in place with, you know, with the material that they, that they were generally born with. Uh, but then in the past couple of years, we discovered that uh, throughout the body and mainly outside the brain, there are cells that can be as old as neurons. So now that we have that data, we can begin to understand how aging affects cells that can be as old as neurons, but outside of the brain and that have completely different biological functions than neurons. Um, but we do know that cells that do tend to have low regenerative potential tend to be more heavily impacted by aging. And that, you know, this is a blanket statement, but I think that if you look at aging and the diseases that are generally associated with aging, cardiovascular and uh, neurological diseases are, are, are very difficult to, 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 to treat and, and face, and they're generally very degenerative, mainly because we can't regenerate those organs. So um, when we talk about hallmarks of aging, um, I think that we have a broad understanding that there is aging will lead to a general dysfunction of how a cell works. And that ranges from basically how ge specific genes or how the entire uh, 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 gene architecture is, is modulated and regulated. And then once uh, uh, the cell needs to make proteins or uh, pr you know, correct, mistakes or damages that occur in different protein complexes. We also know that aging associates with problems in, in that realm. Um, and then that would eventually contribute to cell dysfunction that could then you know, have a domino effect on how a whole cluster of cells or even how a whole tissue works. And then eventually uh, increase the likelihood of, of um, disease and or death. But generally speaking, um, you know, there are defects in nutrient sensing and uh, cellular homeostasis are basically how the cell maintains itself or how well it can maintain itself uh, all the way up to tissues that can regenerate and those that are largely based in, in, in stem cells. We also know that there is stem cell exhaustion. So these cells can't last forever and keep doing their, their uh, function forever. So, um, but I think that it's important to note that these hallmarks of aging might impact different types of cells in different organs at different rates or magnitudes. Yes, and it's, it's worthy to note that your Zoom background is one of your beautiful images of a cell. So is it an old one or a young one? And if so, how can you tell? <laughs> Well, yeah, so, so basically the technology that we developed in the lab is that we combine multiple types of microscopes to 
evaluate the age or to quantify the age of the cell. And what we do is that we introduce uh, stable isotopes to the cells or to the diet of, of an animal. And these stable isotopes are incorporated as the cell matures or when new cells are born, they incorporate a, a certain amount of this isotope. And then what we do is that we let those animals age normally in a, in a, in a normal condition, non-disease non condition. And at the very end, we're able to take pictures of the same cell. And in this case, here in the background, I have a, a asner cell in the pancreas. These are, these are the cells that make amylase, which helps digest nutrients in, 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 in our body. And basically we can aim a microscope at this cell and basically quantify how much isotopes there are left in the DNA of the cell. And the amount of isotope that is left after a certain period of time is proportional to how many times that cell divided or how long that cell has lived. So basically we found that there are certain cells in different organs that retain the same amount of isotope as neurons of the brain. So by definition, those cells were born roughly at the same time and they have roughly the same biological age. That's really groundbreaking. It, it's impossible to do in humans. So this is really cool that you can track it in animals. Yeah. Well, in, in, in fact, well, it's doable in humans and it has been shown, I think in 2012, that you can measure the age or the, or the rate of turnover of fastly turning over cells. Uh, it, it, so it's a stable isotope, so it's safe, it's non-radioactive, um, but it requires you know, patients to stay in, in the hospital for a couple of days. So they, refuse, they receive an infusion of the isotope that then it's measured. You isolate, uh, in this case, it was a, 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 a immune cells that were then isolated and then shot with the microscope. It's doable, but I think that it, when we talk about cells that live several decades long, it's not doable to do it in here. So then that's when the model organisms become very um, advantageous for, for our research. Super cool. So Laura, the, the hallmarks of aging that Raphael um, was describing, they relate back to the geroscience hypothesis. So could you define that for us and, and then tell it, d distinguish that from geriatric research, gerontology and geroscience? Right. So I'll make a stab at that. So, so geriatric medicine, I'll start with that because that's basically a subspecialty of medicine and, you know, like cardiology or endocrinology. Um, and our expertise is in the care of older adults. And that's, it, it's a sort of a broad stroke. So it's very empiric. We're, we're providing medical care. Gerontology is a little bit broader. Um, and that includes the study of nutritional aspects of, you know, older adults or public policy making. And so things that surround the care of older adults, but it, it, it's typically not viewed as a specialty that's looking at aging biology and aging science. So geroscience, which is a, a term that's not been around for, for super long, basically is trying to study what is happening. So gero, aging, science, what is that biology of aging that both that Rafi and Chris mentioned? And First of all, how do we begin to study it in cells and you know in, in model systems? And then how do we think eventually? Because we, I think most of us care about ourselves or Homo sapiens. How do we how do we translate the information from geroscience into something that um, helps us escape age related diseases? So I view it as basically the biology of of aging across species so that we can get insights into those fundamental processes. And I don't know if Chris and Rafi want to put their spin on the uh, definition. I, I think you, you hit it with, you know, try, trying to, rather than studying aging as a disease, it's the idea of studying aging as the root of many diseases that occur late in life. And, and so can we can we target the root process and provide a, a broad spectrum of defense against many diseases with potentially even just a single simple intervention yeah. as simple as we can get? Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. And, and I think that I, I, I believe that one potential way of, of addressing aging is once we under, better understand what is generally associated with aging in, you know, in, in specific tissues, I think that then we can devise ways to prevent certain hallmarks of aging from even arising. 
And then I think that that's where, uh, um, you know, uh, more targeted interventions might actually help is uh, preventing the onset. And because it, it might be, it might be even more difficult to, you know, be, to treat the, the, the a symptom of aging than to just delaying it or maybe even preventing it from ever happening. And Chris, I want to turn to you because I think some really elegant genetic studies in your favorite model organism really laid the groundwork for this. So can you give us that background and what we've learned from uh, your favorite model? Yeah, so it's it's the one I use the most. Um, <laughs> okay. I don't, if, if, if it were a perfect world and we had all the resources and funding that we could ask for, we would want to be working on many different models because I think they all have their own utility um, and they all have their own weaknesses including our, our favorite model. Um, but yeah, with, with C. elegans, you know, I guess what I can highlight in general, not even a C. elegans specific view, but these genetic models, um, these small invertebrate genetic models that are rapid agers, they really, you know, they serve as engines of innovation and discovery for the field, and they have, have done historically. Um, and, and a good example of that is, is, you know, one of the interventions that's relatively public facing that a lot of people, I think, know about is, is dietary restriction and its effects on um, slowing down the aging process and protecting against these diseases. And, you know, the first experiments that kind of discovered that if you starve rodents a certain amount, that they actually live longer, paradoxically. So that was a hundred years ago. And um, it wasn't until, you know, the rise of genetics and, and the, the, the rise of these model organisms like um, yeast, C. elegans, and the fruit fly, that we really figured out what what are the genes? What are the, what are the molecular mediators? What's, what's, what are the mechanisms that actually translate what we eat into this kind of physiological reprogramming that helps us to mm -hmm. age in healthier ways? Um, and, you know, for, for our research, we, we, we like C. elegans for other reasons. Um, we are also big microscopy enthusiasts as we kind of delve into the, the cell biological mechanisms of aging. And um, so what, what C. elegans in particular allows us to do is, is that it's small and it's transparent. So it was just actually surprisingly unique. You know, so we can actually look into old animals as they are alive and watch dynamic behaviors of what's going on with these simple mo single molecules, single organelles inside of cells and watch their behavior. How do, how do, how do these dynamics change in young versus old animals? Um, so it's really powerful uh, when it comes to the genetics and microscopy. And I think it, touching again, I think Laura, Laura mentioned this. I, I would assume that most of our audience members are thinking, what can I do? You know, what can we? What can we as humans do? And this is why it's so critical, I think, for for the basic biology to rely on these animals that age very rapidly. Um, because if we want to learn something new, we have to bear in mind that that you know experiments in humans take a generation. You know, to mm -hmm. to really delve all the way in. There's there's ways to kind of cheat that a little bit and find a, you know, ways to, to derive some information right about how we're aging, but. You know, to do the experiments like we would do in model organisms where we, we create an intervention that lasts a lifetime, um, that's, that takes a really, really long time. Even, even if we're down to mice and rodents, you know, we're thinking two or three or four years to really run those experiments. So with C. elegans, we can run thousands of experiments in, in that time. Um, so that's, that's, that's advantageous, of course, but then we don't always know. You know there's, there's a humbling amount of genetic similarity, actually, between worms and, and mammals, but there are some important differences, too, that, that we need to kind of test out whether they remain true. Well, well following up on that, I, I think it's incredibly exciting, like the original studies of Cynthia Kenyon and others where you just can mutate a single gene and dramatically increase the lifespan of C. elegans. And that was astonishing to me. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's really what I think blew up the aging field into what it is today. And, and it, it's important, I think, to keep in mind that that, that was in 1993. Um, so, you know, the genetics, the molecular genetics of aging is, isn't that old of a, of a field, right? When we think about what do we know in humans, we have to bear that in mind. We, we haven't even had a generation since that discovery to really understand all the way about what this means for, for human health. Um, but I think, you know, that's what's been really exciting is despite the incredible complexity of the aging process, you know, the, the complexity and the interconnectedness of all those different hallmarks that uh, Rafa mentioned, you know, things that occur at the molecular level, things that occur at the cellular level, things that occur in the communication between tissues. Um, and, and so the, the discovery that a single gene 
could have such a strong impact. And, and the discovery was actually by Cynthia was the, the insulin receptor. So it's a gene that's conserved in, in humans. Um, that it could have such a strong impact on the aging process by you know impacting it twofold, I think was, was the data. It's just incredible. And, and it was really shocking. And I think it really opened up um, you know, this hope that we could do something to intervene and just, you know, being a reality. And, and I think that's, that's, again, is why it's an exciting time to be in the aging field today. And, and I think that it, it also talks about the biological potential that, that cells have, right? Because you're, you're basically like doubling the lifetime. I mean, the, uh, you know, in, in the C. elegans, we know that most cells are actually post-mitotic, right? So you basically took a cell that it has not divided since it was born, and you basically pushed it to live twice as long as it normally would, right? So, so I think that that talks about the resilience that that can be tapped into as a as a way to extend, life, you know, longevity. Um, and and there there are parallels in, in at least in mice that I, I know that in my field there have been a handful of experiments where basically you can take the, the insulin producing cells in, in the pancreas of old mice that are you know, at the very end of their lifetime. So you can take these cells and then you can put, you can transplant them into relatively younger mice. Let's say you, know, you take a, an old mouse is generally 20 to 24 months of age. You can take those cells and then put them on a six month old mouse. And then those cells will proliferate and then they can go on for several more months outliving their original host. So, so I think that it talks about, you know, the, the potential that cells have to maybe go, you know, you know, uh, maybe 20, 30% longer than they're generally living. Um, so, so I, I think, and, and I think also talking about, you know, these model organisms, they, they are extremely useful for the discovery of pathways that are generally conserved across the realm of, of, of these different species that are probably the most promising places to actually you know, think about targeting for, for longevity research. Because we know that you know, uh, Chris uh, um, mentioned caloric restriction or these different types of diets, They're, they generally target you know, roughly the same targets that are evolutionarily conserved across these different species. So they, I think that they have a lot of potential. It's just that we still don't really understand how most of these diets work or, you know, what's the effect of what's, how dependent they are on sex or genotype and, and things like that. But, but I think that that's where aging research is going, right? It's. Yeah, I, th I think that's the, so you just hit on the challenge, right? Which is yeah. you know, the, the insulin receptor, you know, discovered by Cynthia Kenny and the worm, and then it was extrapolated, you know, it was brought up the, the, the evolutionary tree, and it, you know, it extends lifespan, mutations in this receptor extend lifespan in flies and mice, you know, and, and there are there's evidence of mutations in centenarians and and so the potential is there can be unlocked but sometimes unlocking it carries too great a cost right in humans it's you hit the insulin receptor a little too hard and then you have diabetes right and so that yeah. it's been really hard to kind of take some of these very central processes involved in energy homeostasis and nutrient sensing and to really yeah. develop good solid therapeutics without lots of problems and i think so that's where it's getting the tinkering is getting increasingly complex now to get it to work but right so I, I do want to bring it back to humans, though. So what are these long-lived worms or the uh, cells that can be extended in lifespan? How do they relate to centenarians or long-lived humans? Laura, can you help? Yeah, so, so I, I'm going to uh, tell you about so the centenarians, of course, are folks living over 100. We actually have super centenarians now. So we actually have a fair, fair cohort of people that are over 110 years old. And I want to, they tell us two things. So they... They have been studied in multiple areas of the world. Um, Italy is known to be one, Okinawa, um, and several other locations where they're just very long lived individuals. And so we think that they're, and they've been studied now for almost 30 years by, by a number of different very you know, uh, smart scientists doing elegant studies. And so we think that, that they provide us some insights into how do you age well and we are looking at the genetics and then it's complex. There's not one gene that's popping out. Unfortunately, it would be great if it was a single gene like C. elegans, but they're, they're, they're gene networks. But the other, speaking to resilience, the other thing that's come out 
of these studies is not all of these individuals just had great lives. A lot of them are World War II vets or have had other very, very uh, difficult periods of their lives, uh, you know, and, and injuries and so forth, and yet they have survived well. And so another theme that's come up in aging research is resilience. What are the factors that allow us to escape life events and still do well. It's not, it's, it's psychological, of course, resilience is great, but there's also physical um, aspects of aging in these older adults that do well. And speaking to heterogeneity, heterogeneity in, in human aging, um, the oldest known person was a woman named Jean-Louise Calmont who lived 122 years of age and was riding her bicycle until she was 119. And so the potential is there. I mean, she's almost double me. Uh, um, but, you know, so the potential even in the human um, aging is there to see improved aging if we can figure it out. And I think resilience is one key aspect that you, you pointed out, um, Rafi. So let's get into a little bit more granularity of, of the biology of aging research that's going on at Vanderbilt. I'd like to hear what each of you is most excited about in your own research pro uh, program. So Rafa, can you start, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so as I mentioned here in the lab, we're trying to understand how cells are maintained across long time scales. So from the moment the cell is born to, to the moment that that cell dies, how, what are the biological events that that, that cell has to face? So that those events are dif different. Uh, so for instance, if you look at a cell that, you know, like a stem cell that keeps proliferating, that cell will have a different set of challenges over time than a neuron that it's, it's you know, standing still and, and not having to worry about proliferation or synthesis of completely new organelles at every 24 to 48 hours uh, as is expected for a stem cell. So here in the lab, we're, we're beginning to understand the impact of how dietary interventions actually affect the cell age. And uh, the, the initial data that, that, that we have is that caloric restriction tends to prolong cellular lifetime. So basically, and, and, and so basically the cells tend to be longer lived. And I'm, I'm not, and that we know that caloric restriction in most animal models, but not all, tends to extend uh, the average lifespan of an animal. Um, so now what, what I'm excited about is actually understanding how dietary modulations actually, mo uh, or interventions modulate cellular longevity. Because it's possible that what these dietary restrictions, you know, and, and we can talk about caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, and uh, fasting mimicking diets and, and, and those different types of, of interventions. But I think that what they're doing is that they're signaling, signaling to the cell that those cells need to rearrange themselves and not think about proliferation as a way of, of enhancing their lifetime, but maybe becoming you know, better cells and, and, and maybe changing the way that they metabolize certain nutrients to achieve proper um, ho uh, uh, homeostasis. And then what we are seeing now is that um, caloric restriction tends to prolong lifetime of cells throughout the body, at least in the different organs that we looked at. There is some data already in the literature supporting that notion, looking at in, in, in uh, indirect markers of cell proliferation, they all seem to be down-regulated with caloric restriction. So, um, but I mean, that's, that's what I'm excited about is actually, uh, you know, achievable dietary interventions that um, might actually trigger cells to be, you know, more resilient and, and potentially uh, live longer. So, so in other words, if you're willing to restrict the energy intake, then your cells can focus on what, what little energy they have on maintenance as opposed to just uh, proliferation and, and expansion. Well, th that's, that's, that's one of the current hypotheses I'm working on. I, and I think that, you know, from biologically speaking, for a cell to, to divide and generate two daughter cells, it's a very, very challenging task. I mean, if, if we think about it, like, you know, a cell that engages into proliferation needs to double its, its DNA. It needs to synthesize a whole new cell from scratch. And 
when you need to make new things from scratch, especially something as large as the DNA and as, you know, as important as the DNA and, and other organelles, there's a high risk of damage. So, or mistakes, mutations might arise and then things might get out of control that might not necessarily give you the cell that you want at the very end. So, so I'm, I'm, what I'm considering now is that what these dietary interventions might be doing and you know, under experimental conditions is that they prevent the cell from actually acquiring more damage that is generally associated with replication. And that, that also coupled with other uh, parameters, you know, including insulin signaling or glucose metabolism in the cell might actually be driving or stimulating the cell to remain in a quiescent state instead of just proliferating. But it, it, it's incredible to think that each of us can control the quality of our cells just by our diet. It, it, it's stunning. So Chris, what are you excited about in your research program? Yeah, I, I think I can, I can hit on a lot of the same themes that, that Rafa just mentioned, actually. So I mean, it, there's this very evolutionarily ancient link between nutrients, you know, and the, the conditions in the environment and, and the aging process. And dietary restriction has really unlocked a lot of that link. And it makes a lot of sense, right? That, that, and it's, it's true, you know, in every animal, basically, that it's ever been really rigorously tested in, that if, if an animal thinks that nutrients are low, that, that things are scarce, it's not a good investment to spend a lot of your energy on something like growing and reproducing, right? Instead, that, that there's a reprogramming that occurs at, at a variety of, of biological levels um, that, that puts that energy back into um, taking, care of, taking care of things, right? Lasting through the tough times to get to the better times. And so it, things like dietary restriction work great, but they, you know, they, it's hard. It's, it's hard to, to tell people to do that, and it's hard to get people to buy into that. And, and then maybe you're obsessed with food, so it's actually not really worth it sometimes. You know? so, so we're trying to unlock uh, you know, the, those reprogramming events and really understand um, what they are so that we can develop small molecules, therapeutics that, that do similar things. And we work kind of one level below um, what, where Rafa was talking about uh, at, at, at how cells are, are doing that. We, we think about how nutrients impact the subcellular environment. And um, just to make a, a quick analogy, you know, we, we know, for example, that at the organ level, you know, we have different organs and different parts of our bodies, and um, they're performing their own unique roles for us, and they need to coordinate with each other. You know, so if you go for a run, your muscles are screaming after a short while at other parts of your body that we're out of fuel, please send us some, and, and activating metabolic responses. So it's really highly coordinated. And it works exactly like that at the subcellular level. Um, where there's different compartments, things like mitochondria, things like the endoplasmic reticulum and lysosomes, um, that all perform their specialized roles and they all need to talk to each other um, to be able to do those things. And so one thing that we realized, one of the things that we've discovered in the worms, um, it's true all the way up to humans, is that the, the shape of organelles, you know, unlike organs, organelles can change shape and they respond to the environment and this is important for how they function. So at the subcellular level, these different compartments are very dynamic. They, they change shape, they move around throughout the cell, and they even interact with each other you know, when they need to team up and signal to each other and coordinate shared resources. And so what we find is that, that those, um, those dynamics between the organelle networks and their communication with each other is breaking down during the aging process. But also this intervention that we know is really powerful is this change in nutrient environments to, to scarce nutrient conditions. This also really dramatically reshapes the cell. So it seems to be a really important programming event. Um, not only that happens during aging, but also what happens in this context of longevity. So that's really, for us, makes it really exciting to delve in on this as a real mechanism of, of improving health during the aging process. And, and Laura, you're, you're using really advanced imaging technologies to delve into organs that are highly dependent on energy, like the brain. So what's exciting in your field? Yeah, so one of the things, and it kind of ties into Tarapa's and, and Chris's uh, work, is that neurons and, and other long-lived cells really rely on um, a process called autophagy. And that is that it, it's really critical for long-lived cells to recycle junk. And they do it, and partly um, to conserve energy, because every time you make something new, it uses cellular energy. Um, but it also prevents buildup of toxic, um, you know, damaged proteins, damaged DNA, and so forth. And so, Healthy neurons actually um, have very little accumulation of material 
Autophagy involves some subcellular organelles called lysosomes to do the, the or among others, but to do the final degradation. And so we're extremely excited um, because we've made a link between chronic low-grade inflammation. And chronic low-grade inflammation happens both in aging, but a lot of disease processes we know promote unhealthy aging, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. We've made a link between inflammation and impaired autophagy in brain aging, in our aging, just normal aging mice. And what has been very exciting is that by doing a long-term anti-inflammatory treatment, we were able to improve autophagy and clearance of proteins. And we think that's important not only to preserve the, the health of neurons directly, but we also have seen accumulation of, of debris, material that wasn't degraded well. The cells kind of, you know, the neurons kind of punted out and kind of tried to get rid of it. Um, and by being a sort of a nidus of inflammation, we think that there's a feed forward cycle where this extruded material is very inflammatory, causes more damage to the brain, more damage to, to neuronal connections. And so this anti-inflammatory intervention actually preserved local neurons near these accumulated debris fields. And so we think that for, because as, as Rafi said, we don't really replace neurons to any great extent, We've got to do everything we can to help assist them in hanging out and staying healthy. And so we think this sort of decrease in inflammation and improved autophagy could have really big implications for um, CNS aging. And so that's where we're excited. And we, we also are developing um, imaging tools to, to try to bring this into seeing this set of processes in humans. So pet, pet imaging is a way you can actually look at molecular events in model organisms, but also um, people. So that's where we're also trying to, to make this translational bridge. That's super exciting. I mean, it, it would be great to be able to peek into a whole organism and see how are they aging, right? That would just be amazing. So we're gonna to turn to some questions from the audience. Um, and of course, one that, that everybody's interested in is, is there specific advice about a diet um, that might preserve your central nervous system and your cell integrity. So, Laura, do you want to start with that? Yeah, so, um, yes, but <laughs> so, um, I think that right dieting more than deep calorie restriction is probably the best way to maintain health. And, and I, uh, Chris alluded a little bit, most people have a, a hard time um, having such a, a a severe restriction that they're going to get the mouse longevity or the C. elegans longevity. But I think a lot of the studies on calorie restriction in humans compared those of us who eat too much versus a really healthy diet. And so I would suggest that looking into um, keeping a BMI of 21 or 22, however you do that, um, not a lot of red meat, all the things that we say are the way to, to have a healthy diet that, that engages the, the best resilient biology that we have. And it also probably does something to our um, genetics, our epigenetics to, to, to enhance our diet. But um, I'm a little at the extreme. I don't think that I want to do a 40% calorie restriction myself. And I think most people have trouble with that, so. And what about intermittent fasting? Yeah, so that actually actually is is not only something that I think is quite feasible, but if you think about a lot of the religions around the world, it's built into uh, you know a, a number of religions as part of of human health, and so I think that the evidence suggests that that might gain a lot of the same benefits as long term very severe calorie restriction. I think is much more feasible, and and I, I actually have to say I've done it a few times. I I felt kind of hungry, but you know. Well, could you contrast that with compressed eating? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I have to say that I don't, I don't know so much the nuances of that, although um, a lot of us who are very, very busy do compressed eating anyway. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't eat breakfast or lunch a lot of times, so I guess that's compressed <laughs> eating. So. Yeah. Well, I think the primate studies suggest that that could be equally as good as uh, intermittent fasting or caloric restriction, which would be great because it's, it's certainly easier 
keeps you less uh, grumpy. Yep. So Rafa, can you tie any of these dietary things back to telomeres? What's the impact? Oh, that, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, well, I, I haven't looked at, so telomeres, okay, so just backtrack a bit. Telomeres are basically large protein complex structures uh, that interact with the DNA at the very end of the chromosomes. And they maintain the structural integrity of the chromosomes at, at the very end. And there is, um, you know, overwhelming data showing that aging is associated with shortening of telomeres uh, in, in cells. So um, one hypothesis is that by reactivating the enzyme that elongates the telomere, you could potentially delay aging. Uh, but I, I haven't, I'm, I don't know enough about how dietary interventions can actually affect telomere health and lead to, uh, to cellular dysfunction. Um, um, it, yeah, it, it's, I, I, I don't think I know enough about that specific topic. Well, one thing I'm excited about is I've seen evidence that DNA damage at telomeres specifically, because they're a vulnerable part of the genome, that um, is, is one of the key drivers of, of senescence, which is a cell fate for a stressed out cell. And I think it's exciting to think that if you just reduce the oxidative stress, which I'm sure happens in your healthy long-lived cells, that might have a huge impact on, on telomere quality. So one area to, to think about. So um, folks are asking about very specific components of the diet. Um, so I don't know if anybody would like to ta tackle NAD levels as well as poly dietary polyunsaturated fats versus other fats. Anybody? So, so polyunsaturated fats, I'd have to say um, there's, there's very good evidence over the years um, that, that those are health promoting. And, uh, you know, the, stu the centenarian studies have, have suggested that those, those are good. I mean, I, I don't know that you have to go to the, the super extreme where you only will use certain okay. filtered olive oils or whatever. But I think that one is strong. NAD levels, I know that there are a lot of over-the-counter supplements and so forth. And I'm not really sure that the, uh, the data is that strong that those make a huge difference because we have an enormous amount of NAD in our right. body. So I'm, you know, this is like a drop in the bucket, but, but I don't know. I mean, I, I have to say, I don't know. So. Yeah. I think and, it, and, and, oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Robin. Oh, no, I, I, I was just basically going to say that uh, I think that for us to really know that these dietary interventions really do work in humans. I mean, we're talking about decades long, you know, studies that need to be, that need to be approached. So, and I think that, most of the dietary interventions that 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 are out there and and you know um, are widely known, I think that they all fall sort of under the large umbrella of a caloric restriction. Whether you eat as much as you can during a specific time and then you fast for the rest of the day, or you have small meals throughout the day, I think that the and and also or if you just restrict your your caloric intake from like I don't know, it can go from anywhere like to ten to fifty percent. Um, I, I think that we are still, we still need, you know, careful studies that look at whether it's, if it's the fasting that it's important or, and, and, or if it's actually the amount of calories that you eat. Um, and then also just knowing how much these effects of the diets in humans is affected by our environment, our genetic diversity, the sex. And, and, and also just how strict you do it. I mean, it, I think that there's evidence also showing that if you do, you know, a couple of days a week of intermittent fasting or of fasting mimicking diets, which are usually ketogenic diets, like low protein, high fat diets, that can also help. Um, but I think that most studies that are, you know, have a follow-up time of a couple of years. So, and also then the other challenge is how do you know it's working? You know, what are the good, measurements that you can make on someone that will actually tell you that the biological versus the chronological age is changing. And there are different tools out there that have been uh, uh, coming out in the past couple of years as, 
you know, there's an analysis um, on the um, uh, methylation levels or basically modifications that occur in the DNA of circulating cells that have been shown by different algorithms to correlate with biological age versus chronological age. There's study from my, my previous institution at, at, at the Salk Institute that correlate the transcriptional output of skin fibroblasts. So they, these are basically resident cells in our skin that can also predict biological age. Um, but I think that it's very important that you know, that we keep in mind that we're talking about decades long studies to really know how well these dietary interventions work at the individual level. Yeah. So, and Chris, can you help um, to discriminate between studies that are focused on lifespan versus health span and comment on what you think is achievable with human lifespan? Yeah, so I, I, this is a really important distinction, I think, in, in all of aging research and especially how we translate it. Um, so we, you know, health span can include a lot of things, just how, how well are you functioning? And there's so many different ways in which you could measure that. Um, so, you know, sometimes in the lab environment, we measure things like lifespan and C. elegans, for instance, because it's just, it's the best measure in summation of how an animal is aging, right? Um, because it saves us some time almost, right? So, but what is much more important than lifespan, in, in my opinion, and I think in, in many opinions in the field is health span. Because I, I, the polling kind of shows this, that a lot of people wouldn't want to live longer if they're not healthy, um, if you, you know, they're not able either mentally or physically to live a fulfilling life in those later years. And so sometimes we, you know, we mix these things together in the laboratory to, to get the work done and to learn new things. But in the end, you know, I think our focus and certainly the, the sort of geroscience approach is really to focus on making the years that we have now healthy. And that can maybe be a little disappointing when we think about this, this idea that, that certain people propose that we should be living 200 or 300 years and the people that are able to do that may be alive today. But you know, when you really think about it, we already know that, that we can live, um, as Laura mentioned, to 120 years old. But how many people are actually doing that? So, you know, if, if we can even just make those more people, if we can get more people to those 100, 120 plus year old ages and get them there healthy, you know, I think that's, that's step one. And that's a, that's a really incredible accomplishment. And, and when, maybe when we get there, we can then think about the societal changes and scientific advances that are going to be required to get to 200 and 300 and farther. Yeah. So... I'd love to hear each of your opinion of, of what we can expect in the decade to come. What do you think is achievable? And um, maybe Laura, start with you. Are there clinical trials ongoing so we might have some of these things answered? And, and what would you predict? <laughs> so yeah, there are actually a, a lot of clinical trials. And I, I just wanted to step back that, that sort of geroscience and longevity research are relatively new fields and they haven't been invested in that much. And, and so the, the uh, progress that's being made is actually quite astonishing given the fact that, uh, you know, this was not where a lot of work was being uh, supported. So I think that we do have um, evidence from, from longer lived individuals in all of the clinical trials that are going. And the, these clinical trials focus on everything from supporting mitochondrial metabolism, to, um, to improving autophagy, to um, you know, mod modulating um, insulin growth, you know, insulin receptor activity, although that is tricky as, as Chris mentioned. But I think that there are actually a lot of studies going on, even stem cell studies that may or may not be as well designed as we would hope. So I think that it's too hard to predict where we're gonna be 10 years from now, but it's exciting to see that there are an awful lot of different avenues being supported. I'm, of course, a fan of inflammation as being involved, and in I see a fair amount of uh, uh, work and research being done in that area. I do think that our understanding about um, having better diets and also being more active and you know exercise we didn't haven't even touched on, but that's actually an incredibly um, valuable tool to improve health span um, and and brain health as well. Um, I think that we have some of the information right now to do it better, and I think that the tools coming out are, are there. Um, after we get done, Laura, you, you might want to just talk a little bit about Synalytics, because those are things that may be coming down the pike as well. So, 
Yeah, senolytics are these, it's the new category of dr drugs that um, really kill off cells that have gone so far down Rafa's path that they're old and damaged and stressed. And so we're, we're developing therapeutics that, that specifically target these cells and can help eliminate them. And it gets back to your point that they are a driver of inflammation. So by doing so, targeting senescent cells, we can dampen inflammation. And so there, I know of about 30 clinical trials at this point with various senolytics. And they've just been a challenge because many of these drugs are um, natural products, which are tricky and um, available over the counter, which is always a dangerous uh, path to, to enter into. Um, so, but does anybody else want to make predictions? Rafa or Chris, what would you see in the near future? Well, I, I, I think that I, I hope that for the next five to 10 years, what we'll have is a better, better understanding of how aging occurs at the individual cell level. You know, dissecting that heterogeneity of aging, even within a single cell population. Um, and then basically, you know, if, if like, for instance, if aging affects neurons the same way that it affects uh, cells in the skin, or if there are, because I think that that would be the one interesting way of actually thinking about, you know, not quote unquote personalized therapies to the cell type that is being affected by aging the most, or the one that is, you know, maybe, you know, like when, as Laura mentioned, like we start aging the moment that we reach adulthood, you know, like in our twenties or thirties. And then I think that if, if you know that, okay, so when you hit 60, the first, the first cell to, you know, really, really have a hard time with aging are going to be neurons and then, or it's going to be your skin cells. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually begin to address um, uh, aging in a, in a cell type manner or an organ manner. Um, and I think that that's, that's what I hope that we'll achieve in the next five to 10 years. Well, it's important for developing therapeutics too. So that, that would mm -hmm. be great. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, uh, scientifically, you know, I would, the, the hallmarks of cancer, I think they, they came out before the hallmarks of aging and needed one or two revisions. And the hallmarks of aging haven't been revised yet. So I, th I think there's still major discoveries um, yeah. awaiting. But I think the biggest thing in the next five to 10 years is, is really, um, you know, the first redesigning the whole clinical trial process, which is, is something that's, that's in, in rethinking how we think about medicine, which in the past has historically been very focused on waiting for a disease to arise and then treating it being very reactive. And so there, there aren't even, it's hard to even design a clinical trial for the type of molecule that we're proposing, um, where it's a broad spectrum of protection against diseases. So really kind of, if some of these first proof of principle types of studies are performed, they can really start to change the government and regulatory policies and even the public perspective on medicine as, as being more, you know, having more of a preventative emphasis and making things easier to develop that way. That's really ambitious, but it's really important. There's no doubt about it. So Laura, just any final words for our audience? If there, is there anything folks can do now until these clinical studies are ready? And how can they support aging research? Right, so, so the three sentence, what can you do now is, is take to heart the actual you know, idea, stay active, stay engaged socially. Of course, the last two years haven't really supported that as easily as we would have liked. And, and do everything one can to stay as healthy as possible so that when all the great drugs come down the pike, um, the substrate will be there. How can, how can this be supported? Uh, you know, NIH has funded much of this research. And so I think keeping our support for our federal funding agency, NIH, is important. But there, all, are, are also, um, a fair, there is also a fair amount of longevity focused research going on right now, including at Vanderbilt. And so uh, funding this, funding these labs, my colleagues here um, will make an impact. And we know that we know that is um, how things get moved forward much more quickly because federal funding is, can be slow and uh, interv you know, providing funding for innovative research can move things along much more quickly. So that's, that's my five cents worth. Thank you. Well, we've learned a lot today about longevity, and this will be uploaded onto YouTube if anybody wants to follow up or share this information with colleagues. So thank you very much to the panelists for enlightening us all. It's exciting times, and I hope we can follow up in the near future because I think progress has been pretty dramatic. So thank you all. Thank you to the audience. Thank you, thank you Laura. Thank you, Rocky. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.